Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is renal neoplasia. So therefore, we're going to focus on two relatively rare benign tumors, oncocytoma and angiomyolipoma. And then we're going to spend the rest of the video focusing on the variants of renal cell carcinoma, clear cell, papillary, and chromophobe. So here you have a synopsis of the five lesions we'll be looking at. So let's begin with oncocytoma, a relatively rare benign tumor. So it's uh, six to 9% or three to 7% of renal tumors, depending on the series. But it's important that you know that it exists because as we do more and more imaging studies on patients, we're discovering these incidental uh, renal tumors. And I don't want you to think that every kidney mass is malignant. Now, oncocytomas are thought to arise from the intercalated cells of the collecting ducts, and we'll be encountering another lesion that is also thought to arise from these same cells. Grossly, oncocytomas are typically single and well circumscribed and have a characteristic tan to mahogany brown appearance on cut surface. And about a third of these will have a central scar. This is indicative of slow growth. Now, histologically, these are some of the most beautiful tumors with this bright eosinophilic granular cytoplasm. But sort of what makes it cool is that the reason it's so eosinophilic and the reason it's granular is because these are absolutely stuffed with mitochondria. So here are your classic images of an oncocytoma. You can see here we have a single large mass, uh, which appears to be well circumscribed. Here's some residual uh, normal kidney here with the white arrows. And you can see this fibrous uh, central scar uh, where the black arrows are. Uh, and it has this uh, tan uh, mahogany brown appearance. And then here is just the classic appearance of an oncocytoma, abundant, brightly eosinophilic granular cytoplasm. The nuclei are round. We see no perinuclear halos, mitotic figures, necrosis, pleomorphism, just a beautiful little benign tumor. All right, we're going to leave that behind and step into angiomyolipoma. Now, this is a tumor that is important to recognize because it is associated with tuberous sclerosis uh, complex. Now, angiomyolipomas belong to a family that have perivascular epithelioid cell differentiation, and these are referred to as pecomas, and they're thought to be derived from pericytes. Now, as you recall, tuberous sclerosis is due to loss of function of TSC1 or TSC2, and about 25 to 50% of those patients will have renal angiomyolipomas. Now, tuberous sclerosis uh, complex is associated as well with cardiac rhabdomyomas, lesions of the uh, cerebral cortex, the so-called tubers that lead to the name tuberous sclerosis, and subependymal giant cell tumors, or SEGA. Uh, the angiomyolipoma is benign, but may be locally invasive, and it can undergo spontaneous hemorrhage. Why is that? Because it is composed of thick-walled blood vessels that are poorly formed, so the angio part of angiomyolipoma, smooth muscle cells, so the myo part, uh, and the adipocyte-like uh, cells, the lipoma part. And there also can be scattered epithelioid cells. So hence the name. Let's look at the histology and the gross. So this is um, uh, the appearance of an angiomyolipoma grossly. You can see uh, here is the renal cortex. Uh, and the tumor has this heterogeneous appearance. Why is that? Well, because it's made of a heterogeneous uh, variety of cells, different cell populations. So you can see here, this is a histologic image. Here are these poorly formed uh, thick wall blood vessels. Uh, we have scattered islands of fat. And then this particular tumor has abundant spindled cells uh, that uh, look like uh, smooth muscle cells. So this heterogeneity explains the heterogeneity that we see grossly. Now that's all folks for the benign tumors. Let's talk about the heavy hitters in the room, the the renal cell carcinomas. So these are about 80 to 85 percent of your primary renal malignancies. Uh, one other to consider would be the transitional cell carcinomas of the renal pelvis. That's about 8 percent of the primary renal malignancies. But uh, in this video, we're going to focus on the renal cell carcinomas. So about 80 to 85 percent. Now, these tumors arise from the renal tubular epithelium. And as I mentioned earlier, there are three types that we're going to focus on in this video, clear cell, papillary, and chromophobe. Now, there are a variety of risk factors. Smoking increases risk, as well as long-term hemodialysis, which can lead to acquired cystic disease of the kidney. So patients who are on long-term hemodialysis can develop multiple cysts in their kidneys. This is associated with increased risk of renal cell carcinoma. And then cadmium uh, exposure, either environmental or uh, occupational, is also associated with renal cell carcinomas. So how do these tumors typically present? 
Well, there is the classic triad of costovertebral pain, palpable mass, and hematuria, but this complete triad is seen in less than 10% of patients. The most common uh, presentation is going to be hematuria, so something that is very commonly seen about 40% of the time. However, something to keep in mind is that this hematuria may be intermittent, so, uh, and it also may be microscopic, so the patient may not notice it and may get picked up on uh, screening uh, urinalysis. Now, one of the interesting things about renal cell carcinomas is that they can, uh, they tend to invade the renal vein and then from there can go in the inferior vena cava all the way up to the heart. And if they do involve the IVC, this can lead to uh, inferior vena cava syndrome, which can be characterized by lower extremity edema, ascites, etc. Now, uh, the kidney has a tremendous functional reserve uh, and is located deep in the body. So therefore, uh, malignancies of the kidney may not be determined or might not be diagnosed until fairly late uh, uh, stage. And in those sorts of cases, patients are going to present with maybe fever, malaise, uh, weight loss, or bone pain due to metastases. They could also present with a perineoplastic syndrome because renal cell carcinomas can elaborate a variety of different substances. So parathyroid hormone-related protein is the most common. About 15% of patients with renal cell carcinoma will present with hypercalcemia. Erythropoietin, which is what we really tend to think about when we think about uh, renal cell carcinomas or the kidney in general, is only seen in about 1% to 5% uh, of patients. And this is um, the manifestation will be polycythemia. But as I mentioned, these tumors can elaborate a lot of different substances like gonadotropins, renin, insulin, or glucagon. So they can have a very varied clinical presentation. So let's focus on our three uh, types of renal cell carcinoma, beginning with clear cell renal carcinoma. So this is the most common of the primary renal cell carcinomas. It's thought to arise from the proximal tubule. Now we know a fair amount about the pathogenesis uh, of this uh, particular tumor because it is associated with a familial syndrome, von Hippel-Lindau uh, Hippel syndrome. Now despite the fact that there are familial uh, clear cell renal uh, cell carcinomas, about 95% of them will be sporadic. However, if we combine the sporadic and the familial, we'll see that about 98% of these tumors show loss of sequences on the short arm of chromosome 3, so 3P. What is on 3P? The VHL gene. Now, we've knocked out one, we have to knock out that second allele in order to uh, actually have uh, a, a malignancy develop. And this will occur due to somatic mutations or perhaps hypermethylation, which will silence transcription. So what does VHL do? So VHL is responsible for oxygen-dependent degradation of the hypoxia-inducible factors, or HIFs. Now, what are HIFs? So imagine that you're in a, a state where you've got uh, some hypoxia. The body wants to maintain homeostasis, so what does it do? It wants to increase oxygen delivery. So we're going to upregulate EPO, erythropoietin, which is going to increase our red cell mass. We're going to... Uh, uh, increase our angiogenesis, so vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, and we will have uh, an impact as well on glucose and energy homeostasis. So there are a variety of different HIFs, and this is what they're involved with. Another thing that HIFs can do is they can interact with MYC to increase cell proliferation uh, and change uh, how energy is metabolized. So let's take a moment to just reflect on von, von Hippel-Lindau. So this uh, is an autosomal dominant syndrome, which is found in one in about 36,000 individuals, and is characterized by a variety uh, of different uh, findings, including hemangioblastomas of the cerebellum and retina. Uh, this is um, almost pathognomonic. Uh, this is an individual with two hemangioblastomas uh, in the cerebellum. That pretty much says, I have von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. Now this is what an uh, hemangioblastoma looks like. Uh, you can see it's got abundant, uh, lightly eosinophilic, somewhat granular cytoplasm, and it has these uh, finely branching capillaries. Now I think this is slightly reminis reminiscent of a clear cell uh, renal cell carcinoma, which speaks to me of the, um, the pathogenesis of these two tumors. Something else you can see in von Hippel-Lindau syndrome is hundreds of renal cysts, and uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma is identified in about 40 to 60 percent of patients. So, what does a clear cell renal uh, cell carcinoma look like? Grossly, it's going to be solid, unilateral, and cortical. It tends to be bright yellow. 
Uh, and this is because it has a lot of lipid content and it can also show necrosis and hemorrhage. And as I already mentioned, they have a tendency to invade into the uh, renal vein and then thence uh, the inferior vena cava. Histologically, we call them clear cells because they're clear cells. So they're optically clear uh, cytoplasm with uh, lipid and glycogen. And they're arranged in uh, little nests that are separated by delicate fibrovascular septa. So let's begin by looking at the gross. Uh, here is an image uh, from Robbins uh, and uh, Kumar Basic Pathology, 11th edition. You can see this large cortically based mass uh, appears uh, somewhat, uh, appears well circumscribed. You don't see uh, tongues of tumor uh, invading throughout. Uh, and then it doesn't really have that bright yellow appearance. It has a sort of a tan appearance. But here is a part of the tumor which is invading the renal vein. And you can see here it has got more of an orange appearance. And that is even more prominent here in this uh, fresh uh, tumor specimen here, where you can see it's got this bright orange to yellow appearance. And that's due to all of the lipid. Here's what we have uh, histologically. Again, this is why we call it clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Nests of clear cells with these delicate uh, fibrovascular septa, uh, which you can appreciate here. Now, let's uh, take a moment to think again about pathogenesis. This is an immunohistochemical stain for HIF-1-alpha. HIF-1-alpha is a nuclear transcription factor. And with the absence of von Hippel-Lindau protein, uh, we're going to have abundant uh, HIF-1-alpha, which is going to translocate to the nucleus. So that's why we see this nuclear staining. And it's going to do uh, the magic that it does that's going to create and contribute to the pathogenesis of this renal cell carcinoma. Okay, so we're going to leave uh, the uh, clear cell behind and talk now about papillary renal cell carcinoma. So this is uh, less common, about 15% of our uh, primary renal cell carcinomas, and it's thought to arise uh, from the proximal and distal convoluted tubule. Now, like clear cell carcinoma, we also have both sporadic and familial uh, uh, cases, and this, they uh, tend to show a trisomy of chromosome 7. What's on chromosome 7? Well, the one that we think is important here is the MET proto-oncogene, which is a tyrosine uh, kinase receptor uh, for hepatocyte growth factor. Hepatocyte growth factor mediates growth, cell mobility, and invasion. Now, I'm going to go a little bit into the weeds just because the WHO describes this and it's a little bit relevant to what I'm talking about, but you certainly do not need to know this in your preclinical years, but it's something you might come across on one of your patients, and I would feel remiss if I didn't mention this. So papillary renal cell carcinoma are divided into two types, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 tends to present at a lower stage, it has a better prognosis, and about 80% of those cases have altered MET function. By contrast, type 2 tend to present at a higher stage, they're more aggressive, worse prognosis, and MET alteration is less common. All right, so what do we see when we look at it? Grossly, papillary renal cell carcinomas are unusual in that they tend to be multifocal and bilateral. Like uh, clear cell tumors, they are cortical and tend to be well circumscribed. The appearance can be very variable. So they can be hemorrhagic, cystic, and they may have what appears to be a shaggy appearance on cut surface due to papillary excrescences. Histologically, we see these papillae, but one of the characteristic features is these interstitial foam cells. It tends to have a scanty, well-vascularized stroma. And then the difference between the type 1 and the type 2 is type 1 is small, single layer of cells, type 2, larger cells, higher grade nuclei, pseudostratification. Again, not something anyone would expect you to know on step 1, step 2, shelf exams, anything like that. Here you can see uh, two uh, gross images, uh, again, well circumscribed, but look how different they look. This is why pathology is challenging. So you can see here, this one is tan, it's got an area of hemorrhage. Compare it to uh, this lesion, which has got abundant hemorrhage and has that shaggy surface I was talking about of sort of this shaggy papilla formation. And here you can see uh, the beautiful papillae. Uh, with these uh, papillary formations, and then these interstitial foam cells just stuffed full of lipid. All right, so let's take uh, a look here. Just because I've mentioned it, I have to show the picture. Here we have type 1. The cells here are arranged in a single layer, very low nuclear grade. Here's type 2. You don't tend to see as many of those interstitial foam cells. You have pseudostratification uh, and uh, some nuclear um, atypia. 
All right, this is bringing us to the home stretch, our chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. This is the rarest of the primary renal cell carcinomas and is thought to arise from the intercalated cells of the collecting duct, like who? Like oncocytoma. Now, unlike uh, the pathophysiology that we understand for the other two uh, renal cell carcinomas, it's not as clear in chromophobe. These tumors tend to have multiple chromosome losses and extreme hypodiploidy. We don't know exactly uh, what the, uh, the mechanisms are, the pathways that lead to it. Unlike the other uh, two variants, it tends to have an excellent prognosis, particularly compared to clear cell. Uh, grossly, um, it will be unilateral, brown to yellow tan, and can have a central scar. Again, this is to, um, it, it indicates a slow growth. Histologically, we have solid sheets of pale eosinophilic cells, and they are characteristically described as having vegetable wall appearance because the cell membranes are very uh, thick uh, due to clearing. And this is reminiscent of what you see uh, if you were to do a, a microscopic section of a piece of corn or lettuce. You see these, uh, these thick walls. Uh, associated with these thick walls would be this perinuclear halo. And there are a couple of, uh, we call it chromophobe because it, it chromophobe, it doesn't have a lot of color, but there is an eosinophilic variant and like oncocytoma, it tends to have abundant mitochondria. All right, let's look here at our gross. You can see here's our tumor, it's yellow tan, and there's our fibrous scar, okay? So as you may have been thinking, oh, when I'm looking um, you know, on, a, on an exam and I see uh, a single brownish tumor with a central scar, I think oncocytoma, this is why pathology is hard. But I don't think that anyone would ever ask you as a medical student to say, ah, yes, this is definitely chromophobe versus oncocytoma. We have to work hard to get to the diagnosis. Now you can see here, this is the classic appearance of a chromophobe uh, renal cell carcinoma. And you can see why we call it chromophobe, afraid of color. It's not clear, like our clear cell, there's this sort of granular pinkiness to it. And unlike uh, what we saw in the example of clear cell, we've got uh, very wrinkled uh, and irregular nuclear membranes. Okay. Uh, so now let's take a look at a couple of different uh, images of chromophobe. This is really nicely showing uh, that accentuation of the, of the walls and the perinuclear halos, which is what we really appreciate here in this eosinophilic variant. Now, if we were to look at this one, it's going to, like oncocytoma, have a lot of mitochondria. So let's put a side by side here, and you can see here oncocytoma, eosinophil eosinophilic variant of chromophobe, and as our perinuclear halos that are really cluing us in. Again, not something anyone would expect of anyone except a pathology resident and above. And then just to uh, finish our compare and contrast, here is our chromophobe, here's our clear cell. Again, I cannot imagine anyone asking you as a medical student to be able to distinguish these two. It would probably, any question that involved this would have some information. So clear cell might mention this patient also had a hemangioblastoma uh, or that in this one there was uh, extreme hyplodiploidy. That's what's going to take you to understanding or to come into the correct uh, diagnosis. But what you can see here is that uh, we have a lot of variation in our cell shape and size compared to what we see here, uh, and then these wrinkled nuclei. Again, please, medical students, do not worry about this. Residents, you can think about it. And then I'd just like to finish with just a, a nice spectrum of the tumors that we've looked at. You can go ahead and hit the uh, audio, turn it off, pause, see if you can identify the different tumors we've just looked at. And then, now that you're back, just for fun, one of these is a uh, brain tumor, and here it is. This is the hemangioblastoma, and I think it's nice again to show, here we see the hemangioblastoma, here is our clear cell renal cell, both of them uh, with VHL uh, being knocked out, loss of function. I think they look somewhat similar. There you have it. I'm going to finish uh, with uh, some questions that you can review to see uh, what you've retained from this talk, and then finish with a uh, beautiful example of a monarch butterfly chrysalis. As always, thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, please put comments down below. Feel free to email me, uh, reach out, uh, check out my website. Thank you.